okay so the next question in this page i see is related to indices right yeah it is about this this question number 12 is all about i should say the concept of physics being applied over here let us look at this question the diagram shows a speed time graph for 16 seconds of a car journey we are being given with this diagram where you can see that the x-axis contains time in seconds right and y-axis is being you know given with speed in meter per second and this is the journey of the car like car starts from here and then moves down like this and comes to rest okay so at you know zero time when the car has the journey is being started the speed of the car is taken as 10 meter per second that is what this graph is telling us and the speed was constant till 12 seconds you can see there is no dip in the graph so till 12 seconds the speed is constant and just after 12 second you can see that it started the speed started dropping down that means there is deacceleration and in the 16 second it got to a halt and the speed becomes zero that is what we analyze when we look at this graph so what is being asked find the deacceleration of the car in the final four seconds a very good question guys we just need to look at the figure and analyze what is given to us to find out deacceleration first of all we know the formula what is the formula for deacceleration we know that whether it's acceleration or deacceleration we have to find out the final velocity and subtract initial velocity from it and then also write down the time taken for the same that is t final minus t initial so what is the final velocity if i talk about the velocity or speed at the end or at the 16th second here v final is equal to zero because the car has stopped completely it is not moving so v final would be zero meter per second and at 12th second what was the you know the initial velocity it was 10 meter per second so if we talk about you know substituting the value v final is zero meter per second minus v initial is 10 meter per second and the time the t final is 16 so it was 16 seconds minus t initial is 12 so 12 seconds let us find out 0 minus 10 gives us minus 10 meter per second upon 16 second minus 12 second will give us 4 seconds and that means it is going to be you know deacceleration will be minus 10 by 4 meter per second square and if i further solve it we know 10 by 4 is 2.5 so it is minus 2.5 meter per second square what does this negative sign signifies it tells us that you know the speed is dropping it is deacceleration it you know the negative sign itself tells us that the motion is getting deaccelerated so what is the value we will write it as minus 2.5 meter per second square that is the answer for this part a of the question i hope the graph is a bit clear to you let me just explain it one more time what is being given the graph is all about time speed time graph so that means the speed is there on y-axis and time is there on x-axis and when we look at it the initial when the you know time started the journey started the car was moving with 10 meter per second and it had you no know, constant speed till 12 seconds and after that it starts dropping down and in the 16 second it came to a complete halt and with the help of the you know basic formulae we just found out the deacceleration of the car in the final four seconds right let us move ahead there is one more part related to this question find the total distance traveled during the 16 seconds guy is a very important thing whenever we talk about you know this speed time graph how do we get the distance if we talk about the basic formula what is the basic formula we know that speed 
is equals to distance upon time or distance covered upon time taken to cover that distance. So if I simply say that I have to find out distance, so distance would be speed times time taken, isn't it? So if I talk about this distance being speed into time or speed multiplied with time, if I talk about this figure, first of all, what is this figure guys? This figure itself is a quadrilateral or I should say is a rectangle, right? And this speed behaves as the width of this rectangle and time is like the length. This is length, this is width and if I multiply speed with time, that means what am I doing? I am actually multiplying length with width and what is length times width? It actually is the area of the rectangle, isn't it? So if I have to find out the distance, distance covered will be the area under the graph when speed time graph is given to us. It's a very important concept. With the help of finding the area of the graph, we can easily find out the distance covered, right? So this area which this, you know, graph is showing, if we anyhow find this area, like this area as well of the triangle and of this rectangle, we will find out the distance covered by the car during the total journey, isn't it? So let us start doing it. Let us do this here. If we talk about this triangle, to find out this triangle, we will use the formula of half base, base being this, base times height and height is this, which happens to be a width of the triangle, a rectangle as well, right? We will use it. Let us now write, since distance, in case of a speed time graph is the area under the graph this implies that distance covered by the car during 16 seconds is equal to area of rectangle plus area of triangle isn't it so let us find out the distance what will be the area of rectangle guys it will be length times width and length is actually 12 12 i should not write centimeters simply 12 so the length comes out to be 12 and it will be multiplied with the width that happens to be 10 so this is the area of the rectangle Add it with the area of the triangle. So that will be half multiplied with its base. Base is 16 minus 12 that is 4. So 4 uh, times height and height happens to be 10 again. So 10. So if we further solve it, 12 times 10 would be 120. Add it with this 2 cancels for 2 times and 2 times 10 would be 20. So this comes out to be 140 meters. So how much distance is covered by car when it travels from 0 to 16 seconds? The distance covered, the total distance is 140 meters. Isn't it? I hope this concept is clear. You may look at it once more and just you write it down for your reference. Right? Let us move ahead. This question is also clear to us. Now the next question I see over here is related to indices. Question 13. This is 3 raised to power 3p times 3 raised to power 2p equals to 729 and we need to find the value of p. 
as I look at it that it can it is of two marks so definitely I'll be in need of solving it and showing some steps so guys if I rewrite it do we know some laws related to exponents the laws of exponents includes product law quotient law power law so here when I see that it is 3 raised to power 3p multiplied with 3 raised to power 2p being equal to 729 I see here that the bases are same 3 and 3 common bases and they need to be multiplied so we will simply use the product law and what is product law product law is about adding the exponents and making the base common so here since bases are same so I'll simply write 3 and will add their exponents so it will be 3p plus 2p and here 729 can we write it in terms of 3 or as the exponential power of or the exponential form of 3 let us first prime factorize 729 somewhere on the rough 729 if I divide it by 3 2 times 4 times 3 times again if I divide by 3 81 times again divided by 3 27 times again by 3 9 times again by 3 3 times and then again by 3 only once so how many times do we see that 3 is getting you know as the prime factor 1 2 3 4 5 6 so I can write this as you know 729 to be 3 raised to power 6 isn't it because 729 is simply 3 multiplied with itself 6 times now let us just erase it so if we look at it and talk about this this will be 3 raised to power 5p equals to 3 raised to power 6 isn't it guys now it seems to be very easy if I have to find the value of P I see on both the sides of the equal sign the bases are same if the bases are same their parts must also be same so I will write it here by comparing by comparing LHS and RHS what would we get guys we'll find that 5p appears to be equal to 6 so if 5p is equal to 6 this implies that p is equals to 6 upon 5 right and if p is equals to 6 upon 5 we can find out its answer to be 1.2 what is the value of p either we can write it as 6 by 5 or 1.2 so it's up to us let us take p to be 6 by 5 that is our answer or 1.2 this is what is the answer required for this question so i hope it is clear use the simple logic use the common you know laws of exponent to solve such problems if you see both the sides to have same basis you can equate their parts to get the answer right let us move ahead and further solve the next questions here okay we have another question where we need to simplify this exponential term here i see that we have 32 x raised to power 10 whole raised to power 1 by 5 again to simplify always look at some composite numbers we have 32 can we divide it or you know write it in terms of the product of its prime factors we can definitely do let us prime factorize 32 and find out that what are the prime factors of 32 32 being an even number will get definitely divided by 2 so if i divide 32 by 2 i'll get 16 16 gets divided by 2 we get an 8 2 gets divided you know 8 gets divided by 2 we get a 4 another 2 makes it 2 and another 2 gives us 1 so what i see over here is 32 is simply 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 that means i can write 32 as 2 raised to power 5 isn't it guys 32 is or can be written as 2 raised to power 5 so if it is the case let us write it 32 
I'll rewrite it as 2 raised to power 5 multiplied with x raised to power 10 and this whole thing is raised to power 1 by 5. Isn't it? This is what it looks like now. Now, there is some very important part that we know that you know, if I write it for you, a multiplied with b raised to power c can be written as a raised to power c multiplied with b raised to power c. Isn't it? We can distribute this exponent to both the bases and have multiplication sign in the middle if they are already getting multiplied. So that is what I am going to do over here. I will distribute this exponent 1 upon 5 to 2 raised to power 5 and also to x raised to power 10. Okay, we can definitely do this, it's totally allowed. This is the simple basics of the exponents, isn't it? But that will help us in solving it, isn't it? We know power law. What is power law? If x is raised to power a, which is whole raised to power b, we will remove this bracket and multiply the exponents, isn't it? This is called power law. What law is this? Power law of exponents. So if it is the case, I see over here the 2 by 5, 2 raised to power 5 raised to power 1 by 5 can be written as 2 raised to power 5 multiplied with 1 by 5, isn't it? Similarly, x raised to power 10 whole raised to power 1 by 5 will be written as x raised to power 10 multiplied with 1 by 5, right guys? This will cancel 5 and 5 and here 5 cancels 10 2 times. So now let us, let us now solve it. So it is going to be 2 as 5 and 5 got cancelled. So we can write 2 raised to power 1 multiplied with x raised to power 2 or x square we could say. So 2 raised to power 1 is 2 times x raised to power 2 is x square. So the answer comes out as 2x square. Isn't it guys? Very easy. The answer comes out as 2x square. So this is how we'll simplify when we are being given with exponents. We have used till now the product law, the power law and even some questions can have quotient law wherein when the bases are same and they are going to get divided, we will simply subtract their exponents. So I hope the you know laws of exponents are clear to you, right? You may note it down for your reference and then we'll move ahead to the next question. Question number 14. This question is about rearranging the formula given to us and changing the subject. What is the subject? Generally the term or the letter written on the left side of the equal sign is treated as the subject which is a dependent variable. Dependent variable depends on the independent variables which are on the right side of the equal sign. So here if I talk about this y is the subject right now. As per this equation, this y is the subject which is dependent variable and this w square and this x, they are independent variables, right? But we are being told that we need to find out a way to rearrange this formula wherein this w becomes the subject while y and x becomes the independent variables. Let us simply do that. It's quite easy. We will be transposing few terms from one side to the other, taking care of the signs. So let us first write down y is equal to 2w square minus x. As I want w to be the subject, better would be that I transpose this 2w square on the left hand side and bring about this y on the right hand side. We need to shift 2w square on the left hand side and we will bring y on the right hand side as I want w to be the new subject. Let us do that. So in that way, this 2w square, when it is transposed to the left hand side, 
y is already there i'll transpose this 2w square so this becomes y minus 2w square and there on the right side we have a minus x so we will keep it as it is now we will take y on the other side first of all how did we get this negative sign we know that whenever a positive number is transposed to the other side of the equal sign it becomes negative and vice versa if a negative number is transposed to the other side it becomes positive the main thing is that the sign gets reversed so that is what we have done 2w square moves here becomes minus 2w square now i want w to be the subject so this y needs to be removed from here so if i remove y and shift it to the other side this minus 2w square remains as it is this minus x is already here since y goes to the other side it's a positive y so on the other hand it becomes negative y we have transposed it to the other side here if we look we have a negative 2 this also needs to be removed i want only w to be on this side so i will simply transpose this minus 2 on the other side so that will make x and y to be divided by minus 2 isn't it this minus 2 is in multiplication here with w square so it goes to the other side and gets you know it divides the other terms over there now let us further solve it here we see that w square is given to us what if i take out this negative sign common this negative sign common makes x minus x and y as x plus y minus x minus y becomes negative of x plus y and here we already have a negative 2 why i have done this because with this i can cancel these negative signs isn't it so the negative signs gets cancelled so we are left with w square equals to x plus y upon 2 and to get w i'll take the square root on both the sides or i should say that i'll transpose the square to the other side that makes it x plus y upon 2 whole raised to power 1 by 2 isn't it i'll make it you know even more visible 1 upon 2 this is how we do whenever we transpose a square to the other side or i should say that if we take square root on both the sides raised to power 1 by 2 is written like this so what is the value we see that if we want to make w as the subject this equation becomes w equals to x plus y upon 2 whole raised to power 1 by 2 now we have changed the subject and w is the subject which is equal to x plus y by 2 whole raised to power 1 by 2. So I hope this part is also clear to all of us. Simple basics transposing one you know element or one variable to the other side and doing the same for the you know making it to be a new subject. So let us move ahead with the next question. Next question is question number 15 and that's a very interesting one guys. This question is about Venn diagram related to set theory. Let us understand this question. On the Venn diagram, shade the region P union Q complement. It's about shading P union Q complement guys we need to first understand that this is a whole universal set represented by jai and then we have a set p and a set q and these two sets are overlapping sets because we see some portion of p and q overlapping each other so these two are joint sets isn't it so now here since this is the joint between p and q what i think that q complement what do we understand by q complement q complement is that set which contains all those elements which are present in no which are not present in q and present everywhere else so if i talk about q complement guys q complement q complement would have been everything which is not there in q but present elsewhere so everything not present in q will be universal set for sure but if i write it it is going to be you know 
set of x such that x belongs to universal set for sure and x does not belong to it should not be a part of what part of everything which is there in q so that will be q this is what is q complement all the elements which are present in universal set but not present in q isn't it and now we need to find out that the region which is p union q dash so p union q dash will be what think about it p union q dash it will contain let me try it for you if i talk about q complement if i have to shade it is going to be everything that is not present in q okay so these are the things which are not present in q i have shaded everything which is outside the set q but now i have to you you know find the union of q complement with p so i need to include those elements which are present in p that will include this as well right guys so this is what it looks like when i have to shade the region p union q complement all the elements of p and the elements of q complement when they are unified then we get a set and shaded like this i hope it is clear to all of you right so i can just erase it and we'll you know you might understand let us just go through it one more time if i talk about q complement